Hi guys. So it's Monday, October 5th, 11 o'clock. So we are starting chapter six. We had a test on Wednesday. So um, I don't know if we should spend a few minutes talking about that maybe. Um, a few general things about the test, uh, you probably noticed a few things about it. Some of you emailed me about it. Some of you had some technical issues. So hopefully those will be resolved, right? So by uh, for the next test, uh, you can work with the ITAC and make sure that those are resolved. Make sure you do not use Safari. Make sure you use a stable internet connection. If um, your internet connection at home is not working well, you should probably take the test on campus or some, or some other place where it's more reliable. <coughs> now, um, as far as the format of the test, so uh, I know some of you emailed me and um, told me that, uh, asked me to, uh, maybe change the format for the next test, which I may probably, I will be quite reluctant to do. And here are some um, main, um, main uh, reasons for that. The, so, so first of all, the type of questions you may have noticed, um, the type of questions that were not quiz type questions, right? They were not quiz type questions. Now, first of all, can you can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, good. They were not quiz type questions. So it was not easy uh, for those who um, did want to cheat, I guess. Not easy to do that because um, it was not easy to find the answers on Google or in textbook because I, I the questions were designed so that you would think about something and generate an answer, right? Like for example, I would give you a peptide and ask you to um, calculate the charge at a certain pH, which is something that you cannot Google or look in the textbook um, or like um, structure of a anti-cancer drug, right? And ask you to look for a specific functional group. Again, something that is uh, something that you need to know from um, your review of OCHEM2 or OCHEM1, and um, so that's one thing. It took me a long time to put an exam together like this. Obviously, it's much easier just to get questions from, you know, test banks that quiz you, but it was actually much more difficult to come up with questions that actually test your conceptual understanding of the material rather than um, the actual factual information. Secondly, uh, as far as the number of questions, I know some of you felt that it was, so the number of questions were too many. Some of you felt it was just and just right. So obviously keep in mind that um, if you reduce the number of questions, then you have uh, more weight, more uh, points for each question and more possibility for you to lose points if you get something wrong. On the other hand, uh, obviously, I also prepared those questions with the, with the idea that I adjusted the level of difficulty and the number of questions so that um, you would spend maybe two minutes per question. Maybe some questions would be even faster. Maybe you could spend seconds if you knew, if you can, could get the answers right away. And then you could spend more time on more difficult questions. But the idea was again, so for you to finish um, not halfway into the exam, but rather actually take the whole time so that you wouldn't have time to actually um, to spend on the internet and look for answers. So that's another point I want to make. Uh, another one is obviously you, you were given answers in a random order, right? Which made sense. What uh, some of you uh, did not like was the 
fact that you could not go back and double check your answers. Well, so this is a debatable format, which I really like because it totally, I, I think it's the most powerful tool against cheaters in my view, right? So uh, you given a question, you can, you know, spend as much time as you want, double check several times and then click submit, but then you cannot go back. And so, uh, so if you um, cheat, if you work in groups, if you, you know, have somebody, somebody else shares your, his answers with your answers, it's, it totally um, stops that. I understand that maybe the inconvenience, so maybe change modification in the way you um, normally take tests, but I think it's necessary for, um, for remote format for the, you know, for the remote learning format, since, you know, we're not utilizing any proctoring tools. So now I would like to hear from you what you think, some of your ideas. Um, maybe we can have a very short discussion. So I would like to get some feedback. Tell me, tell me what you think. For the, um, like when you narrow down the, um, like the pages in the textbook, um, I have the digital textbook and so it's really hard to find those pages. So would you be able to post like the sections as well as the pages of the chapter that we should be focusing on? Why the, you could not see pages in the, in the online version of the book? You can, but it's like hard to tell where the page cuts off. And then also when you type in the page number, it'll like sometimes take a really long time to load and it's hard to tell like exactly what you're intending for us to focus on. Okay, I can do that. Sounds good. Thank you. What else? Well, you're easy. I guess you um, understand my reasoning behind the uh, things that I did. Um, so the, I sent you the average, right, was 62. Um, the high was 97. Actually, two people got 97. And uh, the low was something 30, 30 or something. Um, now, keep in mind that uh, if you did not do well on this test, right, so this is not the end of the world. Um, you have to change a few things so that um, also keep in mind that um, we go, if this is your worst exam and your final is better, obviously, provided that you do not skip any other tests, we will um, drop this score and replace it by the score you get in the final. So that um, can save you if you did very poorly on this test, right? Uh, don't uh, let you, um, you know, totally, um, you know, make you, um, calm about it, right? Don't, don't, uh, you know, that all that means is that you messed up once, but you cannot mess up again, right? So you, you have to do much better on the next tests, second, third, and the final. So that's only one possibility to, um, to fail. So what else, Any, anything else? I will, um, just in case, if you do have some questions and you do have, you do want to share some more, if you maybe you a little shy to do it now, I will open a um, section in a discussion on Canvas. Okay, and so you can post some uh, comments if you want. So that'll be useful for me as well, just um, to read what you think. But I think the exam went well, I think, uh, I mean, I'm quite pleased actually. Um, and the number of technical issues were not so bad, so we could handle those. All right, 
If there aren't any questions, let's I actually have one more question. Mm -hmm. So on the syllabus, it says that like we can't have any like individual extra credit, but it also says that there's opportunities for extra credit on each test. Um, yeah, yeah good. That yeah, good point. So yeah, I forgot about that. So um, yeah, I couldn't quite figure out with, with Canvas, I couldn't quite figure out how to add extra credit without it being counted as part of your grade. No, 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 no in other words, I couldn't quite uh, find a way for Canvas to count it as a um, additional points rather than uh, um, points directly uh, responsible for your grade. So what I'll do is uh, sometime later in the semester, I will give you some extra credit separately. Okay, it will be separate um, assignment, uh, which will cover all the tests. Uh, which, which will have problems from early, you know, from um, from each of the tests, and it'll be separate assignments, so you can do that separately. And um, that way, we can uh, solve this problem. Anything else? I just did something which I don't know what I did. Okay. All right. So uh, if there is there are no more questions, let's get to the material. Let me share the screen. Chapter six. Now the homework is already open. Homework is open in Sapling. It's due on the 14th. There are 30 something questions. Now guys, there's something wrong with my um, laptop like it crashed earlier today. I think uh, Zoom makes it overheat or something. So if it that does happen during this lecture, don't go away, okay? So uh, log in again, maybe seven to eight minutes after I disappear, okay? And um, hopefully we can continue. So if it crashes, the lecture is not over, I'll be back. All right, share screen. So enzymes. All right, so many aspects to enzymes. So one of the, so some of the most important goals for us in this chapter, obviously physiological significance. So that's um, ultimately what it comes down to specifically why we need enzymes, what kind of functions in the body are accomplished using enzymes. Then uh, we will uh, try to understand how the enzymes work, right? So we'll talk about the catalytic power of the enzymes, so specifically how they accelerate reactions. We'll talk about chemical mechanisms of catalysis. So remember again, enzymes are based on organic 20 amino acids, right? So all the principles that the enzymes are based on are organic chemistry principles. So everything you learned in OCHEM 1, OCHEM 2 should apply to the enzymes. So enzymes are not magic molecules that create magic things uh, and not use the um, basic chemical principles. They do follow basic chemical principles and we should be able to interpret the mechanisms of action using what we learned in OCHEM, in OCHEM. All right, then specifically, we're gonna look at two enzymes, chymotrypsin and lysozyme. So some specific examples. 
and we're also going to look at kinetics and inhibition. So here, so this chapter is probably the most, uh, the most, has the most math of all the chapters, specifically because of the enzyme kinetics. So as we will learn, uh, kinetics is a great way to understand how enzymes work, how the enzymes work, and how the enzymes are inhibited. And if you design a new drug, right, you need to uh, assess the drug, you need to understand how the drug works, how the drug inhibits the enzyme. And if the drug doesn't work, you use these data to develop a better drug that does a better job. So, so these are our learning goals. Now, um, what is this? Let me, uh, I have this, um, extra slide I want to use. Why can't I move this? There we go. Some things which I don't have on the slide, but I want to write a few things down. So, well, first of all, as far as enzymes, if you think about catalysis in general, from general chemistry, what do you remember about catalysts? What do they do? They increase reaction rates. Yeah, and what happens to them in the process? They are regenerated in the chemical reaction. Yeah, so they're not consumed, right? So catalysts are molecules which accelerate chemical reactions, but do not get consumed in the process. Uh, guys, if you're not uh, actively speaking at the moment, can you mute your um, microphones? There is some weird so sounds coming from somebody. So, um, right. So, so the just think about it. So, if you have a um, a uh, package of table sugar right, that you put in a coffee or tea. Um, you can keep it on a shelf for a very long time, right? You buy it, at, buy it at HEB or Walmart, you put it on a shelf and sugar, you know, the table sugar is, um, as we will learn when we talk about saccharides, it's a disaccharide composed of glucose and fructose. And it will sit there on a the shelf for a very long time, maybe years, right? Nothing will, nothing will happen to it. Nothing will happen to it. But if you put it in your coffee, right? It will uh, immediately be digested by your cells. You will feel it in your brain right away, right? Your thinking will, will um, improve. You feel the warm sensation of the sugar in your blood. Your energy improves. So the sugar will burn in your cells, in your, in your cells within seconds. Or think of a child, right? Child who is given a chocolate. The child may be depressed, digest, you know, depressed, um, not happy in the morning. You give it, you give him a chocolate. And five minutes later, the child is running all over the place, breaking things, screaming and laughing. And so sh the sugar, sugar high, right? Hit the brain. So all that sugar is metabolized immediately. And so why? Because of the biological catalysts, right? So sugar on a shelf does not have any catalysts in it. Sugar in the body, in the cells, has lots of catalysts to digest, the um, to digest it. So that's what enzymes do. So, um, obviously uh, we also know that uh, many enzymes are responsible for disease, right? So um, like if you lack a particular enzyme, for example, you have genetic mutation in the enzyme or just uh, gene, gene underexpressed. If you have a deficiency in a particular enzyme that can lead to disease condition, for example, um, I don't know, like Hunter disease, right? Uh, Hunter syndrome, 
where um, polysaccharides are not digested, like polysaccharides, which are which come from the cartilage, bone, right? They're not digested, and it's a genetic disease, autosomal, which means comes from both parents. And um, uh, and really bad uh, syndromes and it's fatal, right? So basically mental retardation and accumulation of these polysaccharides in the cells and in organs, in the blood. So um, alternatively, like we talked about kinases, remember what kinases were? What do kinases do? Just to quiz you a bit. So what kind of enzymes are kinases? They uh, break down Proteins? No, those are proteases. They regulate the activity of proteins? Yes, how do they do that? Phosphorylation? Yes, they phosphorylate various amino acids, right? They phosphorylate, for example, tyrosine, hydroxyl group on the tyrosine, they phosphorylate serine, and by doing so, they um, participate, they basically initiate or propagate the phosphorylation cascades in a, in a cell, right? Remember, phosphorylation cascades are ways the signal is transduced from one protein to another in a cell, or the signal is transduced, let's say, from a growth factor on the surface of the cell, into the nucleus where a particular gene expression is initiated and the cell undergo, undergo cell division, right? So in cancer cells, many of these kinases are overexpressed or they're mutated, they cannot be regulated, they're constantly on, right? So they never, they never sleep. They always work in phosphorylating other enzymes, other proteins, and the signal never stalls. Cell, the cell divides, 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 and that results in a tumor that never stop, whose, whose cells never stop dividing. Right, so, so these are some um, issues with the enzymes when they're underactive, overactive, right? So some things I wanted to mention to you. So let me actually write, write these things down so that actually do, you actually understand that. So, uh, so let's say when I say sugar, right? So, um, so like one representative of sugar is glucose, right? So this is the structural formula of glucose. So the group glucose will need oxygen to burn, right? And then it, when, when it burns, it produces carbon dioxide and water. Right? So without catalyst, takes years. With catalyst, takes seconds. All right, another thing I want to mention to you uh, one of the uh, leading, uh, uh, historically, one of the big enzymologists, uh, Louis Pasteur. 
in 1850, a French scientist, French chemist, Louis Pasteur, in 1850. Basically, he took alcohol and he incubated that in the absence of oxygen, so it's fermentation. Sorry, take it back. Not He didn't take alcohol, he took sugar. He made alcohol. He took sugar. In the absence of oxygen, Fermentation by yeast. And he produced alcohol. He produced alcohol. And uh, from that, a concept was, uh, was born. So basically he postulated, so there are these um, molecules which are inseparable from the living organism, from yeast. He called them ferments. Contains Contains ferments. And they are inseparable from yeast, from the living organism. And the concept was born known as vitalism. Anybody remembers what that means from OCHEM 1? In the first lecture of OCHEM 1, we briefly mentioned vitalism. A concept which is supported by the Catholic Church. No? Nobody remembers? So, so vitalism basically a, a um, philosophy which teaches that, or which basically uh, states that all molecules of life, such as sugar or alcohol, can only be pr produced by uh, living organisms, right? So they cannot be produced outside of living organisms. So there is this um, life force life force which is inseparable of living organisms and that actually existed for about 50 years until until scientist whose name was Buchner until Buchner accomplished the same transformation using extract using extract from yeast cells. Okay. And he got alcohol. So basically, so this was the end of the vitalism. 
right? When he showed basically they don't need a living organism to accomplish biological transformations. And all you need to have is these ferments or which, which then later change their names to enzymes. End of vitalism. So you don't need a cell, you just need the enzyme or the complex of enzymes, the end of vitalism. So, what are enzymes? So where are we, where are we? We're 11.30. So uh, what are enzymes? So obviously these are catalysts, right? As we were just told, they increase the reaction rates without being used up. And in most cases, these enzymes are globular proteins. So we studied the structure, three-dimensional structure of proteins, right? We talked about tertiary structure. So these are gonna be globular proteins. And uh, in some cases, the, there are enzymes which are RNA, composed of RNA. Now, in fact, uh, it has been um, shown that the way the biological organisms evolved, originally all the enzymes were based on the RNA. It's known as RNA world. We will talk about the structures of RNA and DNA a little later, but for now, you know what RNAs are, right? So ribonucleic acids, which are components of the genetic system, transport the uh, genetic information from the nucleus to the ribosomes where uh, proteins are made. And the ribosomes themselves are made up of RNA. But they can also catalyze reactions. What do you think um, now, from the information that you know about RNAs, why do you think proteins are much better enzymes than um, RNAs-based um, catalysts? Why the proteins are better than RNAs? There's more variability in proteins. More variability, that's right. So how many nucleic bases are present in RNA? Uh, only four. Only four, and we have 20 amino acids in proteins. That's correct. So, so, the, so the proteins can actually, the, the diversity of structures, diversity of primary structures, secondary, tertiary, is tremendous compared with the nucleic acids. And so eventually RNAs realized that they're, they're not so good at what they do and they're better, they actually much better at something else, at um, genetic information transmission, right? And uh, they passed on the function of um, enzymatic function to proteins. And so what else? So enzymatic process is the oldest field in biochemistry dating back to 1700 and obviously the enzymes um it's such a field that has dominated biochemistry for the past in the past and continues to do so just because of the significance of the enzymes in biochemistry so these are some names of some people who actually have made some major breakthroughs in our understanding of how enzymes work you can look them up. Um, so, so we talked about, so we just mentioned, so the proteins are quite diverse, 20 amino acids. So what makes them better than inorganic cat catalysts? So from OCHEM2 or OCHEM1, we learned, for example, if you have this reaction, Mm, let's say I'm actually I'm gonna do something tricky here. So let's say I'm going to hydrogenate a triple bond Gonna leave space here. 
on a hydrogenated triple bond into a single bond. I'm going to add two molecules of hydrogen. Um, what catalyst would you use here? How would you add hydrogen to a multiple bond? Is it Lindler's? Okay, you're already uh, ahead of me. All right. But if it's not Lindler's, okay, let me draw it here then. Let's say I have an alkene. I'm going to add hydrogen to form an alkane. Will this reaction occur by itself? What do I need? What do I need here? Is it uh, the PD over C? I don't know if I remember that right. Yeah, it's fine. Palladium on carbon. That's right. That's a good one. Uh, nickel, zinc, anything works. Basically, an inorganic catalyst, right? So, so we compare in enzymes with inorganic catalysts. So what do enzymes have to offer? Well, first of all, great reaction specificity. So basically avoids side products. So um, like let's, uh, what, let's see what's shown here. So we have uh, this charismic acid. It's a biological um, intermediate and metabolite, known as a metabolite. And you can see there are many different pathways for its uh, biotransformation, right? It can undergo this kind of series of reactions to give this hydroxybenzoic acid. It can go this way to give you amino benzoic acid, this way, this way. But then you add an enzyme, charismate mutase. And the enzyme basically says, no, we're not gonna go this way, not gonna go that way, not going this way. And this is the way we're gonna go. So high reaction specificity, right? So your inorganic catalyst, now, um, Basically, it sees a double bond and it'll, hide, and it'll accept any kind of double bond. For example, this double bond, you have this kind of double bond, you have this kind of double bond, part of the ring, right? So the palladium and carbon will take any of these. There will be no differentiation. The enzyme will specifically either take one substrate and give one product, take a substrate and give one product, or among many substrates will pick one and perform a transformation. That's why the enzymes have to be big, right? So many enzymes have thousands of amino acids in them. And uh, part of the reason why they have so many amino acids, it's so that um, they can choose the right substrate and produce just one right product and not um, deal with mixtures of compounds and lack in specificity. Okay, one. Another um, important reason, milder reaction conditions. Remember in general, what, I what I'm missing here is heat. Remember we usually put this delta sign here. Remember what that means? That means heat. And um, most enzymes operate at body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, right? With the exception of, uh, can you think of organisms that actually operate at higher temperatures? Thermophiles? Thermophiles, sounds good. There are thermophiles, thermophiles, which lives near what they call hydrothermal vents, right? Hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermophiles. Uh, Now, 
that can operate at temperatures over 100 degrees Celsius. What do you think these thermophiles have? Why don't they, why, uh, what's the problem with uh, living at such high temperatures? Most proteins would denature. Yeah, right? so, so how do you think their proteins would be different from, um, from uh, proteins of organisms that live at 37 degrees Celsius? Like what would you do to their proteins? Like if you were given a couple of their proteins and asked, can you make them stronger so that they wouldn't denature at 100 degrees Celsius? I guess you would want uh, more like non-covalent interactions. So like more hydrogen bonds and more other things from uh, chapter what, three, four. Well, correct. But I think we would want more covalent interactions, no? So we want more disulfide bonds. So you want more covalent bonds so that uh, when you heat them, they don't break so easily, right? So, uh, so that's one way they can achieve. Um, obviously, non-covalent interactions have to be very strong because it's easy to break those. So, um, right, so, uh, so that's what the enzymes do. And uh, they have to, for majority of organisms, they have to operate at normal, bio normal uh, body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. Now, uh, pH. Again, uh, there are some organisms which operate at extreme pH values, but very few. Majority have pH 7, right? And we know for chemical reactions, usually you do it under basic conditions, under acidic conditions, and the enzymes cannot, the enzymes have to be able to perform the same reactions under P, at pH 7. Again, you need to have lots of amino acids, large molecules, lots of cooperation between amino acids. Then high reaction rates, right? So in chemical flask, you put this, you put the um, starting materials, put some solvent, heat it, and then go home, right? Uh, at night and go home, sleep, you come in the morning and hopefully your reaction is done. Now in biological systems, many reactions have to occur so that, the, so that there is communication between various parts of the body, various parts within the cell some reactions have to occur within seconds, milliseconds, even faster, right? So the enzymes have to be able to be able to accomplish those. And finally, capacity for regulation. So the reason why I actually drew this thing, actually, that actually pertains to this last point, capacity for regulation. That's when you have a triple bond, you go through a double bond, and then to a single bond, but you want, you want this product. So you, so you have to, reg, if you just use a regular palladium and carbon, you can't regulate that, right? It will not stop. It will take you all the way from the triple bond to a single bond. Whereas enzymes have these allosteric sites, right? So um, if, you were if you were to design an enzyme, so you would want to incorporate an allosteric site, right? So regulatory site. Like which molecule do you think you would want to bind to that regulatory site so that the enzyme slows down and only and basically stops at this stage? Well, the molecule is actually drawn here somewhere on the slide. <clears throat> I wouldn't be asking you something totally crazy. So um, what would you want to bind to this allosteric site?
How about this molecule, the alkene itself? Right? As the alkene is being produced, right, it will come back to the enzyme, bind to the allosteric site, and shut it down. Or maybe even this molecule here. So one of the products will work, right? So um, as the products accumulate, their concentration increases, they come back, bind to the allosteric site, and slow down the, the enzyme. And so that's a way to regulate the enzyme. So it's a feedback, feedback loop, right? So the product basically, um, so it's called a negative feedback. When the, when the product comes back, binds to the allosteric site and says, you already made me in high concentration enough and please stop, right? So, um, so the enzymes have this capacity for regulation. Inorganic catalysts don't. All right, so there was a lot of information on the slide. Any questions? No, it's all good. All right, let's move on then. Now, another aspect of selectivity. We talked about enantiomers in OKM1. Remember, we talked about enantiomeric drugs. We talked about thalidomide. Who remembers this molecule? Thalidomide. It caused defects. Is that right? Like it was to treat pregnant women, I think, for nausea, but it caused birth defects? So why did it cause birth defects? What, what uh, should have been done to avoid that? So it was, a, okay, I think this is what it was. There, it was a mix that they were taking of the, um, of the L and D versions of it. And the body could only deal with one version, the D version. And so the L version was giving it the bad side effects. I'm sure I mixed up some of that. <laughs> no, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty accurate, right. So you had a racemic mixture, mixture of two enantiomers. Right? Correct? So the two, yes. so yeah, so the two enantiomers were not separated and the um, young women, pregnant women were administered racemic mixtures of both enantiomers and only one of these enantiomers actually treated the symptoms of morning sickness, but the other enantiomer was highly toxic, right? and produced birth defects. Um, right, and so, um, so here's an, and so why is because the enzymes exist as one copy only, one enantiomeric copy, right? So the enzymes are composed of L amino acids only. And so you form a mixture of diastereomers. So here's a L phil and alanine, here's D phil alanine. And so the enzymes, which are L amino acids and L amino acids here, right? So this L and L, and here is DNL, D, DLs, right? So these are diastereomers. And remember, diastereomers have different energies. and have different physical properties. And what that does is that this binds, this binds and undergoes the reaction, so hydroxylation, and this one, there's no binding. So L, uh, phenylalanine undergoes the reaction, D doesn't because there's no binding. Now, this is a funny one that actually um, undergoes binding, but there's no reaction. So with the enzymes, it's not just the binding that plays a role. Once the substrate is bound, there must be a reaction. Okay, so with the enzymes, so uh, um, we talked about uh, binding pocket before. Now with the, or the binding site. Now with the enzymes, we're gonna switch to active site. So because the, it's not just the binding site, 
It's the site where the substrate binds. And also the substrate undergoes the reaction. So substrate. So substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme. And there are key amino acids involved in this substrate recognition and subsequent reaction. So one thing to keep in mind from general chemistry again, so there's a lot of information from general chemistry, we just, we just have to recall that, is that the enzymes, just like any catalysts, they do not affect the equilibrium, right? Remember, enzymes do not shift the position of the equilibrium. The enzymes accelerate reactions, they accelerate the forward reaction, they accelerate the reverse reaction, but they do not shift the position of the, of the equilibrium. And um, so, so this is the expression for the reaction rate, right? So this is not the uh, equilibrium constant, this is a rate constant, right? And so here we have a Boltzmann constant, Planck constant, temperature. Obviously the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction and delta G, remember again, this is delta G of the transition state. Whenever you see this sign here, this, that means transition state. And remember, the rate of the reaction is determined by the activation energy. And the energy of the transition state determines the activation energy. transition state. So the more negative the delta G is, um, hold on a second. Okay, so the delta G, the more negative, the more positive, the two negatives will give you positive, right? Two negatives will give you positive and the larger the K, the larger the rate constant. So you want the delta G of the transition of the transition state be negative. And so two negatives will give you positive and the faster the reaction rate. So here is the, just a reminder of what the reaction coordinates look like in general, right? So we have a substrate ground state goes to the transition state and goes to the product, right? So this is the delta G of the transition state. Uh, delta G basically substrate minus product. And this is the delta G of the activation energy of the reverse reaction. And this is the heat of the reaction. And remember again, the catalysts will not affect the heat of the reaction. The catalysts will only affect the activation energy. And how do enzymes do this? So here is the typical reaction energy diagram for enzymes versus uncatalyzed reactions. So the black is uncatalyzed reactions and blue is the enzymatic reaction. So you can see in most cases, especially when we talk about kinetics of the, react of the enzymatic reaction, what we'll find is that most, enzy most enzymatic reactions undergo this kind of sequence of events. So the enzyme comes together with the substrate, establishes some kind of equilibrium and forms enzyme substrate complex. enzyme substrate complex. This will then undergo chemical reaction at the enzymatic active site and the substrate will convert to the product. And after that, the product will dissociate 
from the enzyme. So that's why we have three humps, right? So the first one is the formation of the enzyme substrate complex. It's right here. Then again, we'll have to climb all the way to up to the transition state of the reaction. The reaction happens. Then we drop down to the enzyme product complex. And then we climb to the uh, transition state of the product departure, right? So again, uh, so if you think about in general, why would there be a transition state for the end for the product departure? So um, why can't just product freely diffuse away from the enzyme? Why do we need a hump in that area? Well, whenever you see a transition state, that means for the transformation to happen, some kind of bonds have to break. So what kind of bonds are we breaking? Just the attractive, attractive bonds between the enzyme and the product, right? So the product has formed, but it may still be sitting at the uh, active site of the enzyme drawn to it through some kind of, some kind of electrostatic interactions, had, um, hydrogen bonding, right? So all that has to be overcome for the product to diffuse away. And once the product diffuses away, then uh, the product can be uh, solvated by the molecule of water, for example, right? Hydrated. And so one type of interactions is replaced by another type of interactions, which is accompanied by a transition state. All right. Do you guys understand this figure? Any questions about this? Okay. All right. And so this is, um, the summary of what's happening here. So, so how do enzymes then lower this transition state energy? Well, they organize reactive groups into close proximity and proper orientation. So if we go back, it's right here, right before the reaction occurs, before ES goes to EP, the ES has to form, right? So now imagine that, uh, let's say, well, this is a monomolecular reaction, but let's say you have a, a bimolecular reaction. Let's say you have uh, two starting materials in a solution, right? They have to find each other before they can react. They have to find each other. Once they found each other, then they can react. So once they find each other, there's some kind of attractive force between them. Right, let's say one is negatively charged, the other is positively charged. But what's unfavorable? So the attraction is favorable. What's unfavorable about two species uh, flo you know, floating in a solution and all of a sudden getting attached to each other? What, uh, what's unfavorable about that process? Just think. Two starting molecules, all by themselves, lots of degrees of freedom, can go left, can go right, can go straight, can go back, can turn, can do this. And once they get stuck to each other, what do we lose? What do we lose once they get stuck to each other? Is it entropy? Entropy. So if they lose degrees of freedom, they lose disorganization. They become organized, right? So we'll lose entropy. And so what does the enzyme do? Look what the enzyme does for us. So let's say the substrate, right? 
has all these degrees of freedom. Now, here's one substrate, not two molecules. But still, it has all these single bonds, can freely rotate about these single bonds, right? And so, so the reaction is slow because of that. Because the reaction, for the reaction, there must be some kind of organization, right? So the reactive functionalities have to find each other. The molecule has to be bent in a certain way. So, and you lose all these degrees of freedom. Let me remind you, the key equation that you should be able to remember when you wake up in the middle of the night, half asleep, you should be able to draw this. Oops. So the process, remember, is highly favorable if, del if this delta G is negative, and the more negative, the better, right? Which means that now think about it. If your entropy, if your entropy, if you lose entropy, and it becomes, let's say, even negative, right? Let's say you lose degrees of freedom. The negative delta of entropy, negative on negative gives you positive. And so delta G will become positive. So the process will be unfavorable, right? So the entropy will slow down the process. And so what does the enzyme do for us? The enzyme will grab the substrate, okay? It'll freeze it, it'll rigidify it. It'll say, okay, I'm not gonna let you go. I'm gonna squeeze you, I'm gonna hug you. And you're gonna stay in this confirmation so that then you can undergo a reaction and not lose any more entropy. And how does the enzyme do this? The enzyme does it through this delta H. The enzyme utilizes all sorts of attractive interactions with the substrate to trap the substrate at the active site, right? And so delta S then becomes unimportant because it doesn't change. Going from S to P, delta S doesn't change because the enzyme rigidifies the S. Okay, so here's, here's um, I'll just explain to you um, the concept, but here is actually, it's, it's actually written out for you as a summary. So the enzyme will organize these reactive groups into close proximity and proper orientation. So with uncatalyzed bimolecular reactions, remember, two free reactants, now, single restricted transition state conversion is entropically unfavorable. Now, for uncatalyzed unimolecular reactions, just one molecule, we have flexible reactant, rigid transition state conversion is entropically unfavorable for flexible reactants. For catalyzed reactions, what does the enzyme do? The enzyme will use its binding energy to the substrate to organize the reactant in a fairly rigid enzyme substrate complex. Here it is. This is rigid. This is rigid. And so going from here to there, from ES to EP, we're not gonna lose any more entropy. And so, so we already paid this entropy. We already paid, paid the entropy cost when, we, when the substrate bound to the enzyme. And so when you have this kind of reaction happening at the enzymatic active site, then the in, re, these reactions will be entropically neutral, right? So um, you already lost all your degrees of freedom. No more degrees of freedom to be lost. Okay, does this make sense? Anybody has any questions about this? Because this is the key to understand how the enzymes actually lower the delta G of the uh, transition state. This is the key of to the enzymatic catalysis, why they work. Okay, I think if you have any questions, just throw your question into the discussion section on Canvas. 
here is a uh, now it's very important that your biological proposal now so far it's all we all we've been talking about is just a um idea right a something that i explanation i did not give you any experimental data to support my uh, hypothesis right it made sense it was all uh, you know um sensible but i did not give you any experimental data to support it so the best explanation the best hypothesis or theory is the one that is supported by experimental data and here are the experimental data that can be used for this kind of support all right so here's the reaction from okem okem so here we have a, a functional group anybody remembers what this is what kind of function group is this Esther. Esther, what kind of function group is this? Ketone. Uh, no. Uh, no. Who remembers? What is this? Should I put this on the on test number two, two as well? What's this function group? Come on, guys. It's a derivative of a carboxylic acid. Is it an ether? No. Is it an anhydride? Anhydride, that's right. So how is it gonna form? We're gonna use this uh, acetate. It's going to attack this carbonyl and the alkoxide is going to leave. Alkoxide is going to leave and form the anhydride. So, so at first we're going to look at this bimolecular reaction, right? And we're going to assign this uh, re um, relative rate of one. Okay. So just relative rate. It doesn't matter what it is. We're just going to give it one. But then look what we're going to do. We're going to make this carbon and this carbon. We're going to connect them. And we're going to connect them. And so that we preserve this function group, we carboxylate, we preserve the ester, but we connect the rest of the molecule. And so what that does is that we are reducing the degrees of freedom in this molecule already. So in other words, the carboxylate does not need to find ester somewhere in the solution. They are already in close proximity. So, so that's what the enzyme can do for it. Right, so the enzyme can grab this, it can grab that, and bring them into close proximity. So you can uh, sort of um, kind of compare this to, to a situation where these two CH2, CH2 are some kind of bonds with the enzyme, right? And then what happens? Once now this is in a close proximity with that, and when this attacks, very little entropy is lost. Now, so I did, I did not say that no entropy is lost, but very little. So, so some entropy is still lost. So can you tell me why some entropy is lost? It has something to do with these arrows. Now, is the molecule totally rigid? Or is there some degrees of degree of flexibility? Yes? Uh, yeah, there's some flexibility there. Right. So there's free rotation about these carbon-carbon bonds. That's right. And when this oxygen attacks this carbonyl, we freeze all these single bonds in one particular conformation, right? So in other words, we reduce degrees of freedom. So we lose entropy. But just by connecting these two, bringing these two together into close proximity, we increase the reaction rate by a factor of what, 100,000. 
right? Five zeros. But oops, wrong. Hundred thousand. Now, all right, so uh, so there's still some degrees of freedom lost. Okay, how about let's go to C. Now you can see that these two are frozen in this particular conformation. Now there is no free rotation. There's no free rotation anymore about these carbon-carbon single bonds. And so this oxygen is immediately positioned right next to this carbonyl. So no entropy lost in, a, in this process. The attack happens, alkoxide is kicked out, and hydride is formed, and we gain additional three zeros. So now we're dealing with, what, 100 million. You can see by just making slight changes to the structure, even though the reaction is the same, right? We're using the carboxylate, attacking the ester to form an hydride, but the structure of the substrate is such that the entropy progressively is less is lost less and less, which would be the example of how the an enzyme would function. So we just showed in a simple chemical system how this enzyme would work and why there's such tremendous rate acceleration. Questions? I always love this. I love these chemical models because there's just, it just always reminds me that the enzymes operate by simple chemical principles. There is nothing unusual about the enzymes. There is nothing, I mean, other than they're big molecules and they, there's much more complexity and it's much harder to study them, but they operate by simple chemical principles. Okay. Principles that we teach in OCHEM 1, OCHEM 2. All right, are there any questions about anything we've discussed today? Yes, no? Something in the chat, lower activation energy. So, all right, so the homework is open. Start studying, guys. Let me know if you have any questions or best just to write something in the discussion on Canvas. And I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.